You're listening to The Local Maximum, episode 226. Time to expand your perspective. Welcome to The Local Maximum. Now, here's your host, Max Farr. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. You have reached another Local Maximum. Way back in episode 70, uh, back in... 2019, I gave my ode to the pod, uh, ode to the podiverse, ode to podcasting, because podcasting really is both amazing as a medium. It's so exciting to get to talk to you guys every week, and uh, it's really been one of the freest media spaces out there. Both a com, it's like a, it's, it's a combination of having very little censorship, but also. The, the listener, you, get a lot of control over your content. You can listen to me. And if you want to listen to me on Twitter, for example, you have all these other voices coming in that might be unwanted. And so, and if I want to listen to you, same thing. So uh, it's, it's, it's very much the anti-Twitter because Twitter is high censorship, but very low control over what messages seep in. Whereas podcasting is the opposite. You have maximum control over what messages seep in, but um, you also are are you also have control over what you listen to. You're not you're not censored. You're not blocked in in any meaningful way. I mean, there's a little bit, but but compared to the rest of the world, almost nothing. So it was designed this way, and podcasting has kept this design. And as podcasting is innovated upon, it must continue to be designed this way. So today, it's a pleasure to have on the show one of the founders of podcasting, if you could believe it, going way back uh, 20 years now, someone who has a really cool background when it comes to media from like, you know, MTV onward, and is currently working on Podcasting 2.0 and the Podcast Index, uh, which is on a mission to preserve, protect, and extend the open independent podcasting ecosystem. One of the most important things that uh, we could be doing right now. Let's, uh, let's pull it up. Adam Curry, you've reached the local maximum. Welcome to the show. Ah, good to be here, Max. I'm excited. I'm excited too. I, you know, uh, part of the show, I mean, I talk to technologists, I talk to authors, I talk to all these people, but one of the things that I talk about a lot is, man, I love podcasting. I love the ability to just do this thing. I love this medium. I tried blogging. It wasn't for me. I, 20 years ago when I was in college, I was on college radio. I loved it. And I'm like, okay, this is like a hobby that I, that I enjoy so much. So first of all, thank you for your role in the development of of this wonderful medium we call podcasting. And I just wanted to start off with something I know you've answered a thousand times, but you know, just, just for my audience, maybe we could get the quick version of what is like the origin of the, the podcast before we get into what's going on today. Excuse me. Well, the origin of the podcast was really uh, built out of necessity. And the necessity was, uh, it started in 2000 with the actual concept, which was not podcast at the time, uh, which was the, um, uh, and I was in Europe at, uh, in the uh, end of 1999, cable modems. Cable modems allowed you to keep your computer always connected, but you didn't have any real, you know, increased bandwidth. That took years and years before that really, really got up to speed. Um, but I saw, um, you know, the, the, the I was always looking to broadcast on the internet. And of course, there's no experience. We had real video and real audio at the time and highly compressed and Basically, if you wanted to see anything that was worth watching on your computer, it still took you about five or 10 minutes to download a two-minute QuickTime video. Sure. So uh, from my broadcast experience, I know that most television shows, even the the nightly six o'clock news, is pretty much produced ahead of time. You're just ready to see it, or you're told you're ready to see it at six. So I was looking for something that could, um, in a way, subscribe or detect uh, when a new piece of content was available that I would be interested in or that I had, had in fact, indicated I wanted, it would automatically download to my computer. Uh, and because it was always on, it could detect, you know, it could always be running a check to see if something was new, but it wouldn't alert me until that item had been downloaded. So then it's a click and it would play. And uh, I convinced Dave Weiner, who had Radio Userland at the time, which was a perfect product. It was, it was the, or the first blogging product, I, I would say, including the news aggregator, all in one. I convinced him to develop it out. He put it in the RSS 2.0 spec. And several years later, um, I saw my first iPod. And the first thing that hit my mind was not 
digital Walkman or Jutebox or anything like this. Now, I thought radio receiver. In fact, the form factor was very close to a transistor, an AM transistor, solid state, nine volt battery included radio that my grandmother gave me when I was six or seven years old, came in a handsome leatherette carrying case. Anyway, so um, I saw that and said about trying to rig up the um, the concept of an RSS feed with a file in it to the, and of course, because it was the iPod, I used an MP3 um, and uh, was fairly successful at getting that done. And then I immediately put that script out and said, okay, uh, I need someone to make this for real because I, I don't know what I'm doing. And the developer showed up. And once they showed up, um, you know, they started making applications. We didn't have uh, phones then, so there was no concept of an app, but they were called applications. They ran on your Mac or your PC. Um, and I did a, a show called The Daily Source Code, which was intended specifically for those software developers. And we kind of worked through those early early days of figuring out how this would should work from a, a user standpoint. But also, I was in a unique position where I wasn't just a user who wanted to listen to stuff on the iPod. Um, I was also a, a creator, uh, and and eventually the name came in through Danny Gregoire, and podcasting was born. Yeah, so um, it's a, a couple things that are interesting in there. First of all, the whole um, the whole technical um, pattern, which you know is very common in software today, which is just you know pre-calculate everything that the user wants. It seems like this is kind of a a, a a similar idea here where you're just pre-downloading whatever the user wants. Uh, and, uh, secondly, like, um, how it, it must've taken a while for this to take off, uh, you know, because you're talking years like 2001, 2002, iPod, uh, how many people had the iPod in 2001? I mean, Probably it, not it, too many. The, the podcasting so, piece hadn't even been done by then. It, it right. really wasn't until, um, I guess late 2003, 2004, and, yeah. uh, and, you know, it was, um, the concept worked and a lot of these applications that were built also kind of made it work with other MP3 players at the time, but the iPod was the, was the clear way to go. I mean, it, it was fantastic because you yeah. synced your iPod already to your computer in order to update your songs. That's how it worked back then. Right. Um, so uh, it, it, it was so obvious that that was, you know, that was the system that would automatically update it. And otherwise you were dragging files over and doing all kinds of, you know, but, it, but it was so compelling. And I think um, it was a lot of the voices, the content came very, very quickly. Um, by the time we had, we only had 5,000 really? podcasts in our directory uh, when, uh, when Steve Jobs called me and said, Hey, I want to put this thing into iTunes. So, you know, the, the content, it grew, but the, the adoption also came very quickly. And it came because of people like Tony Khan from WGBH in Boston, who really dragged NPR into podcasting very early on. The BBC also, you know, the um, really people who were doing the actual creation of the real production of programming, they were the ones that were interested and they just started kind of doing it. And then the BBC got serious about it, but they promoted a lot of their stuff. And so, you know, this was another avenue for existing content that didn't necessarily have a commercial um, value proposition, such as NPR and, and even PBS came to at a certain point and the BBC um, that, uh, you know, that the content makers were excited to get that out in, in other avenues rather than the linear broadcast system of the time. What? Why do you think that the the uh, RSS standard has been continually used for podcasting, whereas it's kind of been, you know, fallen off as a standard for, uh, well, you know, very few people uh, open their RSS reader these days. So wh why do you think that is? Well, I'm going to disagree a little bit because RSS, okay. although, yes, the concept of feed readers and, and news aggregators as an individual application that you use has definitely, you know, when Google Reader decided to close uh, because they, of course, wanted to own the news feed, you know, which Facebook built from the ground up and, you know, other people saw the power. Um, RSS is uniquely uh, qualified for decentralized syndication of content. 
uh, for a number of reasons. The name, at least the acronym as I know it, is really simple syndication. The name says it. It's simple. You can look at an RSS feed and you can understand it. You know, it's, and it, it has some very simple functionality. And you know, even for uh, early, like myself, I was able with Apple Script to to parse an RSS feed. I mean, come on, they, right. that, that's how simple it was. And I, anyone who knows me knows what I'm not. And it's not a software developer. So, you don't have to have some um, special knowledge in decoding, you know. No, that, no, and you, you don't know, need maybe you a don't little bit. Know, you don't need to yeah. know about JavaScript, and you know, it's kind of it's kind of human readable. It looks like an outline that you may have seen in in uh, in a word processing program. Um, so under the hood, um, RSS feeds are being created and used for all kinds of things every single day. Um, uh, and really by people who are individual content makers who syndicate themselves. Uh, when you get into a centralized model, you know, there's a lot of reason to put, ha- want to um, send out a lot more data, perhaps collect data. So having a, a, a much richer environment to do that in uh, is kind of the norm. But, you know, then you're like, you know, level Facebook feed. So they're doing a lot of stuff, but uh, just for the, for the, a, d- a distributed model, and it's also it's something you can't kill off. You know, it's like Google really tried, and they succeeded quite well at, at killing off um, RSS for blogs. Uh, but at the same time, people also discovered that they weren't really good at writing, and people were much better at microblogging. You know, and so enter Twitter, which was actually based on RSS when they really started, with, um, because they were a podcasting company previous to that. Um, Twitter was audio. Yeah, they were audio. I didn't know that. Yeah, it, it launched for a month or two, uh, maybe may been a little bit longer, and then uh, they decided to shut it down and turn it into Twitter. And um, initially, Twitter, I think, was a, an SMS messaging system. And then they, the way I understand it, they, they folded uh, the, the audio infrastructure into it, and they were using RSS feeds. And lo and behold, because this was a centralized service, the fail whale became you know the thing we saw the most, because RSS... It's just it's really at scale to aggregate, you know, you know, if you if you just subscribe to a couple of feeds, yeah, no problem. You know, you're you're any small device can do that. Uh, if you want to be able to search four and a half million feeds, yeah, your device is not going to be able to do that itself, likely, mm-hmm. or it will cost too many resources to to get the job done. So, um, you know, there you go. And Twitter had to scale. That was their they have a centralized model. Uh, so they ultimately, of course, chose for a different path. So it, it's the simplicity, uh, it's decentralized. So um, it's, it's it's kind of indestructible. In a way, it's like Bitcoin, the kind of partners. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I, I this goes really uh, well into to my next question. In fact, I think you almost answered it, but I want to make it more explicit because, you know, when it comes to like these big <clears throat> social media platforms like Twitter or these video platforms like YouTube, you know, we see a tremendous amount of censorship. We see also concern over censorship. People are post things and they're like, well, I don't know if I should post this or not. Um, Very few people feel that way when they're podcasting. Maybe there's some kind of blocking and censoring on podcasting, but it's just not as, as much of a factor as a podcaster. So maybe like, why do you think that is, um, is this, and I, it's probably a lot of what you said, but maybe more explicitly, why do you think that is that podcasting is so much freer than these other mediums? And is this kind of baked into the design of podcasting as it is today? Yes, it's completely baked into the design. Uh, podcasting was always meant to be decentralized. And to a large degree, it has remained decentralized in that anybody with a web server and a text editor and some kind of recording device can be a podcaster. All you need to do is put your RSS feed or file, which you've created in your text editor on your server and, uh, and make it, you know, record your MP3 file and you're good to go. Um, it, I guess when... but why haven't the people who are aggregating these, you know, they haven't successfully been able to, you know, it, it yeah, like, uh, okay, so anyone could post on Twitter, but obviously Twitter's aggregating them. I guess you can't have a third party aggregating these, or I guess we haven't had any significant ones. So it's interesting how... Uh, well, you, you, yep. you've, hit the, you've hit the nail on the head. Um, so when, uh, when Steve Jobs, and we had a nice chat for like an hour, it was really quite interesting. 
Uh, yeah, he said, I want, I want to, to know what he thought. Yeah, he said, I want to, well, he said, I want to put podcasting into iTunes. And I was like, of course. And I said, let me give you the directory you have so far to get you started, which we had done in a distributed open, open source manner. Uh, I, I, I don't know if it was avoidable, but I made an error there, certainly in my thinking, because coming as a broadcaster, I've never had to worry about radios. There's always radios, there a million radios everywhere. Um, but now... Um, I, in fact, kind of let Apple become the de facto radio because they were also the, the on-ramp to podcasting. If you wanted to be in iTunes, you had to go, th- you still have to go through their approval process. Right. Um, that didn't mean that you couldn't manually subscribe to any podcast in the Apple podcast app, which you could. And to this day, as far as I know, you can. And Apple, you know, they acted really as a great steward of podcasting for, mm, you know, my goodness, a long time now, since, yeah, since 2004. Um, uh, two th- no, 2006, I think, is, is more accurate. So, you know, a long time. And they would definitely, from time to time, you know, I think they would block things or not approve them. We really have no data on that. Um, but the very nature of how they did this in order to work with their Apple podcast app their whole index, their whole API was open. Uh, so there were many software developers who subsequently used the Apple database, the Apple index, um, to connect to their podcast apps. And there's a lot of good independent podcast apps. Uh, any one of them sure. could choose at I any time this. not to surface any podcast they want, but most, you know, I think, chose to just leave it up to the user. So that carried on nicely until cancel culture started to, to bubble up. And in 2020, uh, Apple started to deplatform people, and they took down, you know, like it or not, but they took down Alex Jones, the X22 report. You know, these are, it's not really, in my mind, there's no reason why people shouldn't be able to listen to that. And I'm, you know, I, I believe in free speech, and, you know, I don't think that's the answer to something you don't want to hear. Uh, but it could have just been a corporate decision, but it was, in this case, in concert with Facebook and Twitter, and there was a huge deplatforming. It happened overnight, and it was coordinated. Then Apple also started to uh, return different types of results in their API to any podcast app that was attached to it. So it showed me and, and others um, that Apple was willing to mess with the database. And so I called up my buddy Dave Jones, and I said, dude, we can't have this. we got to take it back. We're going to create... Uh, the podcast index, podcastindex.org, and we'll offer an open API to any developer that wants to come along uh, and either connect their existing app or create a new one. And we now have over 20 apps that are, uh, in fact, using podcast index. We have um, more than 2 million podcasts more than Apple has available in their, in their index. And uh, we've brought 17, 18 features to the market, including streaming payments. So there's a lot of things I want to get to there, but first of all, the the Apple, um, the, having two million more podcasts than Apple is that because uh, there's less of an approval process? Is that because Apple missed them? Uh, I'm pretty sure Apple didn't um, kick off two million podcasts. So uh, wh- what's that about? Um, there's, we do not know what percentage uh, just didn't make it through an approval process. Uh, likewise, I. Um, we don't know how many Apple has removed. I don't think those numbers are very big, but you'd be surprised how many people just don't want to be in the Apple index, don't want to do the approve. Um, Every single French radio station refuses to, in fact, most French uh, content creators are not interested in being in the Apple index. And that's some some cultural thing they've got. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't think about it, don't care about it. You know, they... um, it's hard to say, but of the, yeah. I think it's 4.2 million. We, we actually recently went through and we created some new rule sets as what, what should not really be in the index. And, you know, for me, something that was created five years ago is super relevant. It does I mean, relevance doesn't even matter, but if you have right. something that has less than three items and none of them are more than three seconds long, you know, that's probably something that was just a test created on a free posting site like Anchor. And so we weed those out. You'd be amazed. This is an open project. Um, and we have a, a Mastodon server, podcastindex.social. We have hundreds of people 
many of whom are feed experts. And all they do all, all day is just find feeds, you know, parse them, get uh, dedupe them, um, create artificial intelligence with a lot of human intelligence to right. figure out what feeds are valid. I mean, it, it's a it's a fantastic undertaking, which anybody is welcome to join. Well, there are, yeah, there are podcast feeds that are just silence, that are just, <laughs> they put yeah, out. That, that, <laughs> hopefully we catch those and, and take those out of the index. Yeah, yeah. And then there are a lot of, there are, I'm sure there are strange ones out of, I'm sure there's just one of people screaming, you know, like, or there was well, one called okay. walking. If, if, yeah, if it's more yeah. than three seconds, but yeah. um, we there have been a few instances of something that's blatantly illegal. Um, okay. So, you know, but we, we pretty much follow constitutional guidelines, you know, we're, we're in America. So, but, uh, you know, we're open to any suggestions. And uh, I would say the thing we get the most is people just saying, Hey, could you take my feed down? It's no longer relevant, or I don't want it to be there. That's kind of gotcha. the only, only removals we really see. So um, this, so this podcasting index, this is, um, is, is, an alternative to Apple or a, well, I mean, there are other podcasting index besides Apple, but it's, it's supposed to be kind of this, this new freer one. So, so who's hosting this? Um, are, are, is there any like system for hosting it? That's a little more decentralized or is it just going to be, you know, we're going to host it, but we're going to, you know, manage it better than, than it's been done in the past. How's that uh, being handled? So when Dave Jones and I started this, we had two things in mind and it's become a lot more. One is to, protect uh, uh, podcasting and to extend it is part two. Uh, and we equate that in this case, really with protecting free speech. So we already discussed our moderation guidelines, which are not moderation guidelines, they're technical guidelines and, and legal guidelines, of course. Um, the, we host it, so it's, it's an open project. We, we function purely on what we call value for value. So it's... Uh, uh, is based on donations and people who believe in the project or benefit from it and use the project. Um, not only is the API, the, the way software developers can access it, uh, freely available at, at almost any scale. We haven't had anyone tip the scale where we said, hey, we have to figure out something here. Uh, and that's also because the donations have kept in pace with the cost, which is nice to see. Uh, without Dave or I taking any salary, it'd be nice one day. But this is a mission yeah. more than a more than a company. Um, and the database itself, we make a, a full dump uh, available on a weekly basis. There are lots of people who use that. Uh, we do uh, remove uh, um, email addresses so it can't be used by scammers to then go and you know email the whole podcast universe. Um, and lots of researchers use use that for different things. And we also have people feeding information back into the index, which is really nice. So it's become a pretty good uh, open resource that anybody can access. Uh, we're just there to make sure that everything runs and it's smooth and, uh, and we pr provide the best features. And, and that is really what came out of this as the second part was, you know, if you can't make any money, if there's no way to receive value from the audience because you've been financially deplatformed, which is happening at an alarming rate, um, and seems to be, you know, financial control seems to be in the cards for us globally, the way I see financial markets and governments moving. Um, uh, so I'd been interested in a uh, holder of Bitcoin for a while, and I saw the Lightning Network, and when I saw that, in essence, you could broadcast money that's when my radio guy brain went into motion again. I'm like, oh, so why don't we have it like this? Um, I'm broadcasting my MP3 to you, and at the same time, you're broadcasting money back to me, whatever you think, however you, much do you think that is. And yeah, maybe so how can, does, can this be done now? How does that work? Yes, it, it's working now. Any podcast can do it. Uh, and you can start receiving uh, Satoshis, which is a fraction of a Bitcoin uh, in real time, literally, uh, within within 45 minutes, you'd be up and running. Um, you can go to value four number four value dot io, uh, but we also have apps like Fountain, um, and that's also listed in value for value dot io. Uh, the Fountain app, which will help onboard a podcaster in the podcast app itself, which is pretty cool. Or you can go to uh, podcasterwallet dot com, and it will walk you through the process there, even of getting a, a wallet, because that's the main thing you need to have, is you need to have uh, a wallet. 
Um, but you can even just test it out and just, you know, if you have Bitcoin, you can use any of the apps at newpodcastapps.com just to see how it works. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of ways to get into this. Of course, typical with a project like this, you know, we have no marketing, you know, we're doing right, a crap so, job at that. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess the question is why would somebody want to broadcast I mean, I tried out, I tried broadcasting money to well, here's, someone. Here's, Sounds here's cool, how it like, works, Max. Here's how it yeah. works. Um, and I've been doing this for 15 years with the No Agenda show. We discovered that if you want to do a, something that you want to get compensated uh, without advertising or, you know, commercial money of some sort that is making, you know, making you do something. I mean, the basic premise is advertising is censorship. If only you're not going to talk about a competing product or service that your advertiser is. Um, and so, you know, 14 years ago, literally, we decided to just ask the audience to send us whatever they thought our show was worth. And once we saw that it wasn't just $5 a month, some people sent us 50, some sent us 500, and then someone sent us 5,000. And then we figured out that we have no idea what people value something at. And that's the sin of Silicon Valley. You know, they determine how much a song is worth, 99 cents. No, you know, let me, let me determine it. In a lot of cases, nothing. But in some, yeah, I'm willing to pay $99. So... Hmm. Um, this was the big discovery and this kind of, this is where the Bitcoin culture comes in because this idea of value for value and true value, um, carries through Bitcoin culture as well, uh, which made it really easy for Bitcoin related and, you know, techno technology podcasts and also some economic podcasts and all podcasts of all kinds, but obviously Bitcoin starts with it, um, to tell their audience, to teach their audience, to explain to them how they can provide value back to them. It's no different than saying, you know, smash the like button or, you know, hit the PayPal donation link or go to my Patreon. You just have to ask and, and, and there's an education there. And then these very same listeners, they listen to other podcasts and they start reaching out to that host and saying, hey, I really want to basically send you money. Would you like that? You know, get set up you can be set up and running in in half a, half an hour to 45 minutes um and this because of its very nature it's it's censorship resistant money so you can still continue to operate um even with a small uh audience size if they really care about what you're doing they will support you i have the proof of that hmm. yeah we did uh, a couple episodes on the lightning network and um this whole idea of like broadcasting money, as you put it, is really interesting. It's not broadcasting that anyone can can listen to it and that anyone can grab the money, but it's almost, it's coming, it's it's streaming upwards. I want to like think about that more because I just, feel like- It's just bits, man. It's just ones yeah, and zeros. I feel like there's there's got to be a way to like, and this is just off the top of my head, I feel like there's there's got to be something more interesting there than just- Yes, I could voluntarily decide to broadcast money to the uh, to the podcaster, but like, there's got to be something interesting there in terms of, um, well, I mean, the, you know, it, are, could you possibly make a a streamed podcast, you know, uh, uh, only for people who are broadcasting, or or is that possible, or? I'm not quite yeah, sure what you mean. Yeah. Well, like in other words, I have to stream you Satoshi's in order to get your content. Um, oh, no, no, maybe that's no, not see, what you have in mind. No, but. no, this is the beauty of it. See, that's yeah. the old way of thinking is pay to play. Okay. This is, this is play to pay. Okay. So you're playing and then you're paying. That's how it works. And you determine what you're paying. We do, we've made it fun with something called the boost and subsequently the boostagram. So this is very analogous to super chat and YouTube where you can say, oh crap, I want to send someone a thousand sats or 10,000 sats or a hundred thousand sats. And you can determine that yourself. You hit the boost button, confetti shows up on your screen and the podcaster gets a notification. They just got that. And they know that you were listening at a certain timestamp in the episode. The boostagram lets you add a message to that and it comes through in the same fashion. Now you have the feedback loop where the podcaster can say, oh, I got a boostagram here from so-and-so and here's what they said in their message. So how can I um, 
so I, I can make it, somebody could send, hey, that was a really good point you made. I just gave yeah. you a boost. And so I can see that uh, in real time. That sounds pretty yeah. cool. How can I get the local maximum? Uh, how do I know if the local maximum is on the podcasting index? Is it likely there already? Or um, I'm pretty what, sure it's on the index. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Do you have a video RSS feed as well? Uh, no, no, it's just audio. Okay. Um, so if I go to podcastindex.org and I type in local maximum and why, yes, it's right there. Very so cool. all you have to do is literally click on the lightning bolt, uh, on your page there on podcastindex.org and it'll take you right to podcasterwallet.com. It'll pre-fill the information. You verify your feed, you choose a wallet, you're good to go. What can podcasters do to support your efforts here? Well, um, so we, we, um, I think one of the coolest things we developed uh, as this, you know, when you start to get into programmable money is the concept of the split. So you can determine as Max, you can say, you know what, I want um, 10% of, of every Satoshi that comes in or every payment that comes in, I want it to go to um, my, my investor because he helped me buy some gear. Or maybe you have a co-host or maybe a guest, you know, I'll give them 20% of that particular episode. Similarly, and this is something we architected into the system, if we don't let the entire ecosystem benefit, i.e. mainly the software developers who really have had no way, they're not, they're not in the money flow of podcasting. They're not getting any Joe Rogan money. You know, they're not getting, yeah. <coughs> excuse me, a piece of any ads that, that run through their app. So they're, they're relegated to subscription models, which can be okay. Like I think uh, Marco at Overcast does, has a nice life and he's built a nice, nice business for himself. Um, most people develop this in their spare time because they just want to have something cool. Um, and uh, uh, so we allowed for the splits to be predetermined, although completely transparent. And we, as podcastindex.org, always say, please put in 1% for the index to keep our side of the infrastructure running. Some apps will, will say, mm, I want to take 4%. They may put the 4% fee on top of that split, but that's a separate issue. Um, uh, so that they can continue to, you know, to be rewarded for the value they provide with their otherwise free application. The podcast at all time has control over the splits they want. And the listener ultimately has the control. I mean, every app has the list of everyone and their percentages, what they receive. Uh, you can send it individually. You can decide to send it to all. You can, you know, so most people just send it to everybody and they're very happy. The great thing is the joy has been separated from the monetary value. It's gotten to the point where people are, I mean, people are literally saying, this is the most fun I've ever had parting with my money. <laughs> and they love doing special numbers, you know, certain number sequences that are meaningful or that make the, the, the host guess what it is. It's an identifier. It's like a tag, like a nickname. So all these these gamified elements just create or come to fruition by themselves without any real thought. It just happens. Does do any of these efforts include like building uh, recommender systems for uh, po uh, podcasting? Um, like, do you think there should be? recommended recommender systems for podcasting like hey given you're listening to this you should listen to that and are the current you know the the current players are they kind of tipping the scales in any way do you think well this is uh so along with by implementing the value for value payments streaming payments we automatically created something that's known as a namespace and what that is is it can extend something like rss so you can add more features. And that's where people showed up after years of waiting for Apple to, it's kind of chicken and the egg, right? If, if you want to have a new feature, then you have to create that feature in your feed. And of course, the, the app also has to understand it and show that feature. And right. Apple, Apple had no, had, I mean, why would they? They just, they just had their box. They weren't interested in any further development. They were selling. Well, uh, sometimes they add their phones. own. Right. Sometimes they add their own features. They that they add, want. Yeah, they they like the single click subscription. They definitely added some of their own stuff in there, which is fine. Um, they, and they also did that through a namespace, which is the the iTunes namespace. So the podcast namespace 
uh, specifically, we have things like transcripts and we have, you know, which is uh, for closed captions or subtitling. We have chapters with links, which can be, we're being used in, in many different ways. Location tags. We have the whole taxonomy project so you can identify which persons, which is great for search engines. Uh, it, it just goes on and on and on. And one of them is indeed promos. We have trailers, promos, and there is a recommendation tag. And so these are slowly being implemented and, and experimented with. As long as someone is using it, we'll, we'll put that tag into the namespace. Um, what seems to be working really well is having the podcaster themselves use the recommendation tag and say, here's a couple other shows or episodes that you might want to listen to. That seems to be a more valuable recommendation than some AI. What I personally like, and I do this with my own shows with chapters, is that you can, because it's external to the feed, you can have a third party or third party app create this part of the content for you. So I like crowdsourcing, uh, or as I say, using our producers. And there's one gentleman whose name is Dreb, Dreb Scott, and he uses a tool called Hypercatcher, which is an app where you can set markers for chapters. And then there's a back end to it. You go in, you add, you know, your links or your or your images and just save that file. And boom, it, it works in all the apps automatically. So I could also outsource my recommendations to a third party, which could, of course, also be some AI engine that on my behalf recommends things that I'm interested in. And I think my audience would be interested in now bringing these things to market um, um, is easy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, the concept and having one implementation, but having other people use it kind of goes by user demand. So we want people to try the new apps out. Um, and, and you know, there's always an easy way to, to feedback to the developer or jump into the conversation at podcastindex.social. And, uh, and just, I mean, we, we welcome everybody, software developers, uh, content creators, hosting companies, doesn't matter. Everyone's voice is equal. Yeah. I feel like if, if I were to add, you know, a, a, it would almost be like an associated podcast section. Sorry for the unsolicited product advice here, but I like, I'd want to add, Hey, here are podcasters who have been on my show. Here are podcasts where I've been on their show. Here are my favorite podcasts that I listen to that might not be relevant to my podcast here. You know, I, there's like all sorts of things that I can, uh, I can tag. Um, but yeah, so all of this requires, you know, if I'm hosting a podcast, all of this requires that I alter my RSS feed, right? So if I have a host that doesn't, you know, um, you know, that, 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 that doesn't allow for, uh, uh, this kind of like, you know, extensibility of my RSS feed, like, what do I do? Like what, what host should I, should I get in order to do this? Good question. Um, so first of all, um, we consider the RSS feed always to be the source of truth. Uh, but in the case of the value for value streaming payments, um, we actually deliver the uh, the payment information uh, that you uh, that you want that when you onboard into podcasting 2.0, the index actually houses that payment information. We have nothing to do with the payments. We're not an intermediary. But when you use a podcasting 2.0 app, it will recognize uh the payment information, because th that data is coming from podcastindex.org. Um, of course, you can always modify that in your feed itself. You can do that by hand. But if you go to newpodcastapps.com, you can change the filter, and it'll show you all the hosts, all the podcast hosts, and what features they support. Uh, top of the list, without a doubt, Buzzsprout, rss.com, fireside.fm. And there's, there's a lot of hosts who are, in, you know, international hosts as well, who are adding features. Some of them, you know, have other priorities. Some of them are very small organizations. Some of them are very big and have all kinds of timelines that have to change. So these things take time, but you'll see uh, particularly chapters, transcripts, these things are all, uh, are all findable on many of the, um, the, the, uh, the big recognizable hosting companies. Yeah, I definitely like to keep on on top of that and see if I could add some of these. You features know what's also fun? There, we have an, another just a website called Sovereign Feeds, SovereignFeeds dot com, and in there you can just search for your podcast and you can say and it'll bring up all your episodes and it's an editor with all the podcasting two point features. So you can go in see what those features are. You can actually uh, output 
an RSS file that would be your feed with the 2.0 features. And, you know, if you want, you can put that somewhere and add it to the index or just experiment and see what it would look like. Yeah, uh, that sounds like a really good place to start. Uh, absolutely. So, um, okay, so let's see. I don't know. So this will contribute to the decentralization of the podcasting medium. How do you plan to keep podcasting decentralized? I mean, I don't want to put that all on you, but <laughs> but uh, like, do you, do you think that these efforts will keep podcasting decentralized uh, into the into the like you know medium term future? Uh, is that kind of your hope? No, I think so. That that's not my hope. That's my mission. Um, mission. Right. You know, will we eventually be able to distribute the 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 index itself in the database? Absolutely. Uh, will we right. have an accepted, proven, well functioning method to distribute files um, over you know some form of decentralized mesh type network? Absolutely. Um, all whatever is necessary that's at the really time cool will come. And so, you know, the first thing that was necessary was the index and the payments and everything else I think will, will fall in place. And there's a lot of smart people in the group who think about that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. So, uh, uh, where can people go to learn more about this? And also like, where can people go to learn about, uh, your stuff? So podcastindex.org, it, it looks a lot like just a, a website with a whole bunch of podcasts, but there's a menu up there at the top, and you'll see developers and apps and, and value for value, which shows you all the current podcasts that are uh, uh, value for value payments enabled. Um, you can also join or just follow me, Adam, at podcastindex.social. Uh, that's a Mastodon, so you can follow me on it from any Mastodon instance. Um, and if you have any, any trouble, you can always email me adam at curry.com. That's easy to remember. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much the, the best way to, to get to me or to find out about uh, podcasting stuff we're doing. Uh, we also have a podcast podcasting 2.0 podcast, go figure. Um, and, uh, it's once a week on Fridays. It's kind of the board meeting where we review everything that's going on and podcasting in general, uh, beyond, you know, the, the, the steering groups and the committees and the award shows and all that, you know, we're just saying, hey, what's really going on here? What are we really contributing? How are we keeping it, you know, as you say, decentralized? How are we keeping everything open so it, you know, we protect it? Oh, that sounds, that sounds good. That sounds like it's the, the, the super insider for podcasters. Like get the inside. A little bit, what's, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds kind of nice. I'll, uh, I definitely check it out. So, all right. Yeah. Adam, thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure, Max. I appreciate the opportunity. And, uh, and let me know if you uh, you run into any trouble uh, getting up and running on uh, value for value streaming payment. No, I'll give it a shot for sure. And I will let you know, you know what, I'm going to be determined to make sure that uh, I get that set up um, as this goes out. And, uh, and I'll let you know if I, I have any trouble. I think I should be able to figure it out. But uh, I think we'll see. <laughs> I've, already, I've already got the lightning network set up. So <laughs> I think I could do it. You've, you've uh, got you, you got a node you're yeah, I mean, you're yeah, you, no, you, I don't have a node. Can, I, yeah, I, you have I, a wallet or something. I have a wallet, you, yeah. You'll be up and running pretty quick. All right. All right. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. My pleasure, Max. All right. Now, if you're on Twitter, um, I'll add, you can go to at podcast index org and follow them there. But this is a good opportunity, I think, to check out Mastodon if you haven't done that yet. Uh, on there, we have Adam at podcast index dot social to get to um, Adam Curry's content on Mastodon. I follow him from the main Mastodon instance, Mastodon Zodge Social, which is kind of, you can have different Mastodon instances, and you can follow each other cross instance, which is kind of a very interesting way that Mastodon works. It does take some getting used to, though. Also, the Podcasting 2.0 podcast, I like that idea, having like a board meeting podcast. I mean, maybe I don't want every board meeting on a podcast, but I, I, I feel like I do that informally here with Aaron sometimes. Like, where are, we, where are we going with the local maximum? Maybe some of our long, like, two-hour discussions don't have to be on here, but some of the quick, uh, some of the quick, quick thoughts and, uh, and, 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 and quick takes and, and, and our, our short ideas need to be on there. So I've been listening to uh, – so coming back to um, Podcasting 2.0 podcast, I've been listening to that on Podcast Guru, which I downloaded recently. It is an app that allows you to access – these podcasting 2.0 features, not every app does, um, and I don't think the, um, the the standard apps on the iPhone do. I also use Overcast. I'm not sure if Overcast does, um, and, and I'm pretty sure the standard 
I, I, iPhone app does too. Those are good apps for getting podcasts sometimes, but um, if you if you want to see the future, download Podcast Guru uh, and uh, and check that out for sure. I definitely want to check out the value for value thing. I haven't done that yet. I'll I'll let you know how it goes. All right, all links will go on the show notes page, localmaxradio.com slash two twenty six. Have a great week, everyone. That's the show. To support the local maximum, sign up for exclusive content and our online community at maximum.locals.com. The Local Maximum is available wherever podcasts are found. If you want to keep up, remember to subscribe on your podcast app. Also, check out the website with show notes and additional materials at localmaxradio.com. If you want to contact me, the host, send an email to localmaxradio at gmail.com. Have a great week. Feel the power. 